that is an extremely cute, slightly awkward, 100% hardcore developer. Yeah, he's a co-founder of Browsling uh, and Testling, and has wrote hundreds of libraries in package manager. Today, he's going to show us an awesome and easy way to develop a database. Let's give him a round of applause. Hello. Great. So today I will be talking about a micro database. Micro databases. So what do I mean by that? Um, apologies, first of all, for the lousy translations. Um, and also, I only could find a simplified D data set, which will become relevant later in the talk. So I wrote the program that generates these translations. That's what they saw. Um, so first of all, let's let's cover a little bit of, of background to give this talk some context. So I'm a big fan of this. It's the Unix philosophy. There's a lot that's been written about it, but you can simplify it all down to when you make a program, make your program do just one thing and make sure that your program does that one thing well. So instead of trying to build a program that does a lot of things, or instead of taking an old program and adding feature after feature after feature, just make a new program. Make a simple program and make a program that you can combine with other programs. So there are these principles in Unix philosophy. These are, these are some of my favorites. So modularity, of course. Um, this is about how you can build a program that the input of one program becomes, or sorry, the output of one program becomes the input of another. So you can stack programs in long pipelines that achieve some complicated task using simple components. Another good tenet of this philosophy is composition. That is, it's similar. You should just make pieces that you can recombine. And you should only really write a big program um, if you absolutely cannot figure out how to do it otherwise, because there are so many benefits of writing small pieces. You can understand them, you can test them, and most importantly, you can get other people to help you, because if the program is easy to fit into your head, it's easy to fit into someone else's head, and then they can come along and send you pull requests, and they can build pieces that sit on top of yours. So one of my favorite databases in Node.js is this thing called LevelDB. So LevelDB is the C++ library originally written by Google for Google Chrome. It's what powers IndexedDB in browsers. And it's a really small embedded database, a bit like SQLite, but it's just a simple key value store. But there's more. So um, you have the basic stuff that you might expect from key value store. You can get keys, put them, delete them, and you can create atomic batches. But the most important part is this thing called create read stream. What this lets you do is you can specify ranges for the keys to appear in. So for example, if you want to say you in your database you have all of the letters of the English alphabet, A through Z. And with create read stream, you can specify like greater than M and less than Q. And that'll give you a set of letters between those two values. So what does level B even look like? So the cool thing about level B is it's really, really easy to get started. So all that you have to do, create a new file, require level after you've NPM installed it, and then you just give it a path. So call level with a path. So I de test that me, right? And that path can be anywhere in your file system. So now we can do things like de.put foo and then a value, like bar. So if we run this program, it will just exit. But what it's done is it's actually created a value there. So now if we comment out our put and do a get, we can now get the value that we just put. So we get a standard node style callback with the results. So I'll just print out both the error and the result, and I'll run it, like so. And cool, we get the value back. 
that we put in previously, so there's persistence here. Um, what's really cool, though, is if you have some data. So here, I've got some data in this file called data.json. So I've got dog, cat, horse. Those are my keys and some numeric values. So using LevelDB, we can use that method that I mentioned, uh, db.batch, to insert them all. So here I can just require data.json. Now I can give it a callback. That's a standard error, error back. And I'll just ignore the error for now. And so once our data has been inserted into the database, we can use to click edit. So here I'll just get horse to make sure that it works. So do that with your value, console.log, value, equals value, like so. Cool. So now if I run the database, all value is undefined. I'm going to chase that. Let me print out the error real fast. Oh, not found. Okay, so apparently, of course, it's not in our data set. Ah, let me try the cat. Oops. You don't get cat. That should work. Anyways, this. <laughs> this is being strange. I'm not going to mess with this too much, though. It doesn't work. Let's move on. Well, so anyways, this under non-talk conditions would, would totally work. Um, actually, so we can use something to test this now, actually. So why don't I just create a read stream? Um, because we've already inserted that into the database, and I'll not give it any parameters, and this should tell us all of the data in the database. It's probably something silly. Okay, cool. Oh, so it's not actually doing a batch insert for some reason. Anyways, so level can be. Um, not, not so great for live talks, but it's pretty, it's pretty great. The main thing about LevelDB is that it sorts keys in lexicographic ordering. So that's, that's this idea in computer science where you just sort things as strings, and A comes before B, comes before C, but uh, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive. Like this case is simple, A, B, C, but harder case is like, what do you do with numbers? Well, you have to treat every value as a string. So 1 uh, comes first, but next comes 10 instead of 2. Or next comes 14. So this is a little bit counterintuitive um, with lexicographic ordering, and that's what LevelDB gives us by default. So we can use this fun module called ByteWise that sort of helps us with, with that problem. So you can if you use ByteWise, then you get this uh, numeric ordering like you might expect, so it's much more intuitive. But you get all of this extra stuff. So ByteWise actually will sort things based on the type of the argument. And importantly, it will sort arrays component-wise. So this is a recursive process if you have items in an array. That means that uh, you can have arrays with like, different, different values, like we can have user names expressed in this kind of fashion for our keys. But we could also have posts alongside them, like you might make on a website. So you can store a timestamp and a username, and you could even store an index. Like here, we could store uh, we can store our posts indexed by a user. So if I want to get all of the posts by substack, then I can just query uh, this as the less than, and this part as the greater than, which you can do with types. So that's what I can show next, which will hopefully work. So now, um, so I'll do db.batch and require the users.json, which will hopefully work. And to test that, I'll create the stream and the callback. Just to make sure that we have some data. So, 
that's not right. Okay, that's a good idea. Thank you, Marnie's. Oh, thank you. Right, so that was the other problem. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just fix it in the code because that's easier. So, users. Okay, var users equals require users.json.map function r return r dot type equals put return r. Okay, cool. So that's a movie. So now, cool, we have some data to play with. Hooray. Uh, thank you, audience. So now, what we can do is we can use ByteWise and Lexic graphic ordering to do some fun stuff. So now I don't, luckily I don't need this anymore because it's, it's in our database. But what I can do now is use uh, ByteWise. So how you use ByteWise is you specify this thing called the key encoding. So all that you need to do is require ByteWise for that and then you're on your way. So another thing I uh, should have done is value encoding JSON, but whatever. It's too late for that now. Anyways, so once we set uh, our key encoding to bytewise, what we can do is now instead of having less than a string, we can specify an array just like we were specifying in our, in our keys. So if I want to get, for example, all of the users in the system, I can say users and then we can use the property of uh, sorting that ByteWise has, where null is the first thing and undefined is the last thing. So if we want to get everything in between, usually strings and numbers, what we can do is have null be the first and undefined be the last. And that should now give us all of the users in the database. Oops. All right, and I know we need to batch in there. So. so this should give us users. Well, normally it's would. Um, hang on, I'm gonna just comment out stuff to see what's up. Ah, so I think I'm gonna mute this database real fast because it's kind of important. So maybe. I'm going to use some Vimfu and say less than and turn that into type put. There we go. What? Okay, so to fix that, put with put, oh hang on, put comma. Okay. Okay. Right then, heroin. Make sure it's valid. Totally is. Okay. Like coding. Okay. So if we now do db.batch require users.json, then. And I'll click it. No, fuck it. <laughs> okay. So we should at least get values now. Yes, we do. Great. So. Now that I've fixed my talk, we can, we can proceed. So here, we can get a list of users by specifying a greater than and a less than with arrays that lexicographically sort component class. So what that means is, um, what does that mean? Uh, I just fixed it. So what we should have is the key should be the user. User, oh, thank you. Plurals, okay, I've put in. Yes, success, okay. So it's fun, it's fun about that is you can also get posts using the same trick, but singular, not plural. There we go, so here's all of the posts. 
Um, you can also get posts by a particular user, actually because we're batching code and we can set the value and code correctly too. Okay, so let's do this. So we can get a list of posts. There we go. Um, we can print out these posts. We can also get posts for a particular user. So for example, if I want to print my own posts um, with Substack, I can use the post uh, the post dash user key, which is indexed by its particular user. So if I do that, then post user. And here I'll use process arg v2, which is the first argument to the program. And I should get yes. So I get indexes, and then I can resolve those indexes by doing another deep back get. Um, so the db dot get r dot key, which and the value that I want should be this timestamp, because then I can uh, reverse reference back to the original thing. So db dot get, which is r dot key of two, and post each other. So post r dot key be two, and then I'll just constant dot one that. So so then that doesn't work, of course, because I'm quitting. Um, post r dot key to let me print r really fast. Okay. Um, so there's no data. Oh, right, I've, I've forgotten to uh, specify an argument on the timeline. There we go. Uh, so that document is not found. The reason for that is that actually the, the name comes at the very end. So we put the name in there too, which we're given on the command line. Then do all of this. Exactly correct. Hooray! All of the posts by Substack, all of the posts by Dominic Tar. Cool, this is the kind of thing that you get pretty easily in another kind of database. So why on earth would you want to write your database code in this kind of a way? Like, I personally don't don't find it too problematic, but I can I can definitely see that it might be you know a, a bit you get you get less functionality out of the box completely for free. So um, so so why would you want to do this? There's there's a good reason. It's modularity. You get extreme modularity when you write your code this way because you can pass the database parameters around just like nothing. You can create this thing called the sub level where you can partition your database as much as you want. Um, and I'll, I'll show that real quick. So if we want to create two databases, um, we can very easily do that by just requiring a module from NPM, so this one level sub-level, and there are hundreds of these modules. And we can wrap our database like this and do the key. So if we want to make like a user's sub-level, we can do that, and we can also have other kinds of data living alongside of it. Like for example, we might have an account system, but we might also have like a translation system or something wacky like that, which I'll get to. So uh, a nice thing about sublevel is you can also do nested encodings. So this is very nice when you're writing a package that you want to run at npm, because when someone passes you a database as an argument, you don't have to you don't have to communicate upstream to people who use your module that internally you're using a particular encoding, which is very nice. Um, so let's get into something even even wackier using using this amazing level DB technology for something very concrete. So I got all of this working yesterday, but there's this there's this very cool data set called uh, say, user share dict D. So there's this database called Stardict. Unfortunately, it's only a uh, only simplified Chinese, but it's a Chinese to English database that's completely open source and liberally licensed. So there's a couple of files. There's an index file, and then there's a gzip um, dictionary file. So we print out oh, g unzip. There we go. So here we have the Chinese, and the other file we have an index. So I wrote a program that takes 
that takes uh, an index and the gzip dictionary file, which is that and that, and it cross-references them and then prints everything to standard app in a nice way that's easy to parse. So here we're seeing all of the all of the words in front of you from our database. And what all of the translations are, I have no idea if these are even reasonably accurate, probably not, but whatever, close enough. So, that's fun. Um, so, let's build a database on top of this. Um, great. So, the first thing we can do is create a constructor that just takes a database as an argument. This is a very common pattern in LevelDB modules. Um, it lets you... So, the other approach would be to like, require level inside of this package, but that, that's really not as good because then um, there are all kinds of different implementations of LevelDB. As long as you write to a common interface, you get all of these wacky other benefits. Like, for example, you could use LevelDB in the browser because there are polyfills for that, or you can use all kinds of alternative implementations, or you could be passed to sublevel, which is a very nice abstract way of doing things. So anyways, um, like I mentioned earlier, you can use uh, level sublevel to have nested encodings. So this means that we can use bytewise inside of our package, like this, where we have a value encoding. And now we can start actually writing methods. So here I'll have a link function that will do db.batch to insert some documents atomically. So we can have links. So this will map. Um, so in this function, we have parameters a and b. a is like the source language and, and word, and b is the, the destination language and word. So we can just create a link from language a to language b, and vice versa. So language b to language a. And that's pretty much all that we need to do to populate our database. So then to query our database, we can just use create read stream like I did before with uh, greater than and less than keys. So here, uh, we'll take from a language and a word and to a language, and we'll use null and undefined to pick out a range. And then, uh, we can just push these values to the output stream in our function. So our get function is a, is a readable stream, and it produces output. So, tying this all together, we can use the parse dict um, package that I showed on the command line to pipe into these two files, the, the gzip dictionary and the index file. And once we've done all of that, we can then populate our database. So we can call dot link with the source and the destination. And this is our entire import script. Like, this is all that you need to write an import script for this data set. Then to query it, we can just call dot get with our parameters on the command line. So this is all that you need to do to write uh, English to Chinese dictionary and vice versa if you have a data set. So let's do that. Okay, so here in the MDB directory, uh, so I've already run the import script because it does take a few minutes, but I've got a, a get script, which is pretty much what I just showed you in the slide. And I can run that with uh, getting rid of from, so I'll do English, and two zh, which is the code that I used when I populated it, I think. From yes, and two. Okay, cool. And then a word like robot. There we go. Maybe this makes sense. <laughs> Who knows? So uh, we can also go the other direction. So we can go from Chinese to English with one of these words. We get robot in Telebox. I have no idea where that came from. It's in there. So cool. It, it only took us, like, these, these files are all fairly short, but most importantly of all, they're modularized. So this dictdb package is actually something that you can just install from NPM and you can populate it, and it's completely separable. So all that you need to do is create a LevelDB instance, give it to this module, and then it will do what it does. Is translate things very poorly. Um, but if you have a better data set, then it works much better. But that's kind of a silly, goofy example, but there are other kinds of examples that I think are more common and widespread. So I'll just talk about one of them. It's uh, a modular way to use user accounts for like a, a normal website in a, in a modular fashion using LevelDB. 
So what we can do is just require local like normal, give it a directory for data, then we can require this package a countdown. The countdown just manages all of the database stuff correctly, but importantly, it, it has a pluggable interface for, for inserting different kinds of login policies. So the most common example is basic auth, like username and password, and it does all of the hashing and everything properly, which is kind of difficult to do. But what's nice about packages in NPM is that we can compose our abstractions and just build upon what other people have made, which is really nice. I mean, that's mostly what programming, I think, should be about. But what's cool, too, is that we can plug in different policies if we want later. I haven't written these, but somebody else could eventually. Um, so you can have, like, GPG, asymmetric crypto, or, like, maybe an RFID plugin. It's, it's all quite simple. And then, all that you need to do is you just create uh, an account like this with a you know, username, password, and value if you, if you want. We can list things, uh, and when you have challenges, like when you have a, a, an HTTP route, like that handles post requests, you can just call this function, users.verify, and pass in credentials, and it'll tell you if it worked or not. Great. So the other, the other part, before I show a demo, is this thing called level party. This is something that I wrote that sits on top of LevelDB. And normally, LevelDB, because it's an embedded database, won't let you open the same data set between two processes. But level party lets you do that by using this package called multi-level. And multi-level just sits up on RPC connections so that you can, it creates a Unix socket, so you don't have to worry about permissions too much. Um, anyways, once we've done all of that, we can tie in this, this other package called a countdown command. And so you start with a countdown and a, a database handle like normal. And then you can just require the package. So here I have a basic HTTP server. And it will just list the users um, on port 5000. So we just hide all that into this handle.js file. But then uh, if on argv, we have the command users. We can pass all of the remaining arguments to this account down command package, and that handles all of the user permissions on the command line. So you can just manage all of the, your user accounts from the command line or from like a, a REST endpoint if you want. So let me just show that. So this is just all of the code. It's just what I showed on the slide. And we can first run a server. So this runs on 5,000, so if we curl the lowest 5,000, we get an empty response. That's because I haven't populated the database yet. So I can do the user's command, and actually I can do help, as in like help and all that kind of stuff, because it's just fully encapsulated. And so I can create a user. So I'll create a user. First thing I have to give it is an ID, which can be a username, or it can just be an integer. And then you do uh, login, Type so login.basic.username equals substack and login.basic.password equals b and then you can give it a value if you want. So I do all of that and now if I curl the website, cool, I get user ID which is 1000. Um, what's fun is I can also do exactly the same thing from the command line. And so I can get that user ID, its values, I can delete users, I can update passwords, all that kind of stuff. So you can sort of maintain a, a web server in the command line in this very modular fashion. You can just drop it into pretty much any, any web server that's, that's running. Um, so that's fun. Uh, another, another good application of LevelDB is well, first of all, we should talk about this, this crazy approach called content addressable data. So I've written this little haiku that describes it pretty well, I think. The haiku goes, key of document is the hash of its content, addressable blob. Um, what this means is that when you create a document, instead of giving it an arbitrary key, you give it the hash of the content. So you could do something on the command line. So you like you create a document. Maybe it's just a message that says hello, 
So instead of saving that under key like message or hello or something, you save it under a hash, like a SHA sum. So this would be that message's name. And this has all kinds of neat properties because if you know the hash, then you sort of implicitly know the content. Um, so, and I used the translator on that haiku. I have no idea if that makes any sense. Probably not, but it's probably funny. So, uh, demo. So, luckily, there's a pretty nice module um, in Node.js called Content Addressable Blob Store that lets us do this kind of stuff. It's actually written by Matthias over there. So you require content addressable blob store is a mouthful. And uh, then you make a new store just by giving the blog store a path. So like temp blog. And now we can store the create write stream, um, which returns the writable stream. And then we can listen for the finish event and print out what the key is. So if we console.log.w.key, we'll get the value. And so if I, if I type standard in into our writable stream, then I should be able to see the document. So, blog.js. Cool. So you get a blog. Um, and why don't I create another one? Hello, Taiwan. Cool. So I get another document. So now to read these back out, um, we can get rid of our writable code now and do store store dot create read stream and set the key to the uh, process rv2. And so now we can type this to standard error. So now we can read some keys. So the first one, beep boop, and the second one. Hello, Taiwan. Cool. So it works. Um, this is a really powerful approach when you use something like LevelDB because you can have attachments. So instead of having the database handle all of that for you, you can just very easily bolt it on yourself when you need it. And what's good is that this module, Content Addressable Blob Store, uses this thing called Abstract Blob Store. And there are wrappers for all kinds of things like S3 or other kinds of storage mechanisms on top of that basic interface. So it's very easy to, to like plug and play different kind of stuff. But also, the really cool thing is that uh, replication, and in particular, multi-master replication, that is notoriously difficult in most databases, is fairly trivial to implement when you have a content addressable store. This is because you can just, you have two parties who want to replicate data. You can just send all of the hashes that either side has to the other, and then you can do replication. So let's do multi-master replication in some, some one-liners. Okay, so I wrote a module pretty recently called Hash Exchange that just does the first part, which is exchanging hashes. And what this looks like is, first of all, we can just create some messages. So here, these are just going to be from, from the arguments on the command line. And we're going to take the key will be the SHA sum, just like the confident addressable store. And the message is the value. So you can just now require the Hash Exchange module and the hash exchange module takes a callback that should um, it should return a stream that will look it up. So you could very easily stuff in a uh, content restable blob store in here if you wanted, but for now we're just using a thing in memory. So the next thing you can do is you can call provide to tell the other party what keys you have. And then you get an event called available that tells you what, what keys you can fetch from the other party. So if you want to get them, you just call request. And that's pretty much all you need. So, and then um, you get a response event when the hash has been changed. So this is all that you really need to do to do the first part of multi-master replication with blob stores and constant addressable data. So, and of course you need to hook up the wiring. So here I'll just type standard in to the hash exchange stream to standard app. So, what does that look like? Um, so here I've, I have that exchange file that I was showing you a moment ago. And so if we run exchange with some keys, so let me pick some keys, ABC, XYZ, DEF. 
Um, it prints out this ASCII garbage, but what it's actually doing is it's saying, oh, I have these hashes. So the problem is um, in Bash, it's a little bit hard to, to pipe one program to another program and then back again. So I have this little, little module called uh, dupe sh that runs on the command line to do that. So this will pipe the standard out of the first program to the standard in of the second, and it pipes the standard out of the second program to the standard in of the first, which is on my shirt. Uh, this is called a duplex, uh, duplex pattern or duplex stream or something like that. But it's basically like a telephone where you have two parties who talk to each other. Um, and this is kind of a common thing that you see with Node.js streams. Anyways, we can do this on the command line, uh, which is nice because now we don't have to set up any kind of um, like web server, TCP server, something of that sort. So now if we give, so if we give the second command some of the keys of the first, but not all, and some keys that it doesn't have, now they'll trade hashes, and as you can see, um, the second program got the hash of XYZ, and the first program got the hash of GHI, which is what it was missing. So both sides of the connection got what they were missing because they requested uh, those things from the other party. So once we have a system like this, implementing uh, replication is, is relatively straightforward. So I have this new project, it's Wacky Mad Science called ForkDB that lets you do this kind of thing. So this is a forkable offline first data store built on LevelDB and ByteWise and all these kinds of abstractions that I've been talking about. So it has multi-master replication and um, it's quite simple. So the basic model of ForkDB is that you have links that point backward and they're content addressed. So if we create a document C first, um, if we create a new document and we want it to sort of extend the other one, like you might see with Git, then you just pass a hash to the first one in, in your new document. So the nice property about this is that it can only point backwards in time because you have to have generated the first document before you can generate the second document. So you don't have to worry about um, security as much because uh, it doesn't matter who you got this document from, you know that the, the causal chain of custody wasn't violated just because that's how hashes work. So then you create a new document A that points at B, which points at C. So the nice thing about ForkDB, though, is that you can actually have multiple heads. So X can point at B, but also A. If you query ForkDB for heads, it will give you A and X. So what does that look like? Sure time? Yep. Yeah. So uh, here I have it running locally. So I'll give it a directory, which is a, a local DB directory, um, and, and uses content addressable blob star too. So I'll hit temp A, and I'll say create, uh, yo, and then I'll pipe some data to it. So, hey, yo, and create it, and here's our hash. So now, if I do get, and that hash, I get hey, yo, cool. So the other thing is, um, let's see. So now I can create a new document that links to the previous document by doing create.hash equals that hash and create.key equals the key. So now maybe you only get capitalized. Okay, well that worked. <laughs> okay, cool. So now if I run for TV um, get that, I should get a yo. So the other thing I can do is I can query what the heads are. These are the most recent documents in the entire database. So if I do that, um, I can get the heads of yo. It's cool, I just get this one document. Even though there have been multiple documents at that point, yo, I can actually just query the history too, which traces back, which traces back the history of the below it's not working. Oh, right, you have to get hash. So, cool, and that points backward any time, which is great. So, but the cool, crazy, wacky thing that you can do is if I create a new database um, with a different message, like yo, and I point, um, 
and point back at that. So P is yo, and pre.hash is that. Pre.pzio. Um, then our first database can point at the second database. And then, and standard in. So once we've done this, now we can run replication. So I've implemented this as the sync command. So if you do sync, it uh, prints out stuff using hash exchange. So we can take two of these commands and actually replicate them with one another. So we can take A, type that into B, like so. We sync. Okay, so. Cool, so now we have the messages from the second database in the first, and vice versa. So we just did multi-nested replication on the command line just now, showing all of the moving parts of that. So what I want to do with this basic idea is create this thing called WikiDB. Um, and I just made the project on GitHub just about 20 minutes ago. And this will be, well, this is something that inherits from ForkDB. It just adds, adds a few features like timestamps that you need to uh, do to make uh, an offline first distributed wiki. So it can be like wiki be recent. Uh, if I get a database, which. So if I create a document. Now I can create a recent changes feed. So we have this really fun thing in Oakland called Oakland Wiki that I think is really fun. But the best part about it is you can see what everybody else has done on the website using this thing called recent changes. So I want this kind of thing for doing better programming documentation. So I've nearly got it all working, but the idea will be to publish really small cookbooks in a sort of distributed, decentralized fashion. And then people will be able to to use these recipes um, offline on their computer. So they'll be able to just query their local index, figure out all of the cookbooks that they have locally, make edits and fork them. This is for this project called Cyberways Institute that I'm running in Oakland um, to teach people people programming. So um, some some more micro databases that are built on LocalDB are like MailDB. That's a uh, it's a uh, Level DB based email server I've been working on because Google turned off my domain. So whatever, I'm making my own email. Um, Batch DB I was using for doing job queues. And this this fun one by this uh, this guy making uh, forum software and node has built this thing called QDB that's really cool. It's, it's similar to Fork DB, but more for their use case. Um, so here's some links and things. You should also check out the level me up on Node School that Max talked about earlier. It's at nodeschool.io. And then I'll have this wiki powered cookbook up soon. Um, so thanks. This is what my script says. Thank you. It's, and this is what goodbye is. I'm pretty sure that those are kind of wrong. But thanks. Yeah. 
So is it is it a good idea to use LibMD for a, a bigger project? Um, well, I don't know. Maybe it, it really depends on what kind of project it is. I think where LibMD really is good is a good approach is when you have a pretty well defined problem and you need to take that problem and sort of encapsulate the parts. So I think LevelDB is a good fit for if you have a lot of services and they need simple things like the caching system or like even a user account system. If you just have LevelDB doing just that thing and just that one thing doing it well, then it can be a really good fit. Like you probably aren't going to have have replication issues if you're just having user accounts, because those are pretty simple if you store all of the rest of the data on different systems like content addressable stores or like some sort of elastic storage system. Um, but it's a really different way of designing systems than like, using relational databases that you do a lot more for free, but it, that comes at a cost that you pay later when you want to rearrange things and do, do stuff in a different way. Uh, I want to ask you is about how about this level DB performance? Oh, how is level DB performance? Yeah. Great, so level DB is pretty fast at what it does. Um, I don't know exact figures, but it's Pretty comparable with it. Like, so what LevelDB is, most other databases have something inside of them that, that's approximately what database, what LevelDB is itself. They just hide it away in MySQL as NoDB or that kind of thing. Or some databases are built on top of BerkeleyDB, that kind of stuff. Um, LevelDB is actually used inside of React and I think some other databases. But it's, it's more that it's a lower level primitive that you're dealing with instead of having that abstracted away behind other layers, which has benefits in terms of modularity, in terms of like expressive power, but it comes with a cost of like, it's harder to do some sorts of things. It's, it's, you have to figure out what modules you need to like glue together to do something instead of having an easy ready to go solution. I think it's the biggest problem. Because the performance is pretty much the same as you would get elsewhere. So it's pretty fast. Yes, and uh, I have another question. Uh, how about recurring, like, uh, um, at two sides, one side right, right same table, and another side to three? Yeah, so. Sorry, so, LevelDB is single process only. Um, but you can use other abstractions, like you can use RPC to access all of the from multiple systems. Like one approach is multi-level, or like I showed in my talk, you can use the module level party that implicitly sets that up for you. Um, or you could use like a rest endpoint, but it sort of inherently exists on a single server. Okay, uh, I have only one question. How to become a hardcore programmer? How to become a hardcore programmer? Well, <laughs> write, write a lot of programs. That's what I would say. Oh, yeah, and run Linux probably. That, that helps. Oh, yeah. Well, not everyone can want to do it, but if you can, sure. <laughs> Uh, could it be used in remote sites or on your own? Uh, so you guys, could you use it on a remote site? Yes. Pre a DB remote site now on your own. It's not a problem. Um, I don't, I don't know how you mean, like, how do you mean remote site? Uh, such as I, I established a database in, in our country and uh, 
不用干扰。那我第一发要用你的 server 还是哪里 ？My other server is local. Oh, so you could do that. You could have a database on a completely separate server that you connect to. But a lot of a lot of the benefit of using LevelDB is that all of your data lives locally. So the latency is much much lower when you keep your data locally as much as possible. And what I would probably do is not have not access the the database remotely, but maybe access the data through endpoints if you don't need all of it locally. Okay. Uh, now let's give Tent another big round of applause for this effort. Um, that pretty much concludes the open for speeches today. Uh, there's a few things I need to remind you. Uh, the first thing is that please remember to return your translating device. Uh, because you probably need to get it for your personal ID, so it would be really convenient if you forgot to return them. And uh, in case of lost and found, the uh, lost and found section is located in the uh, second floor, the registration counter. And also, if you want more about hardcore programming, please remember to come to the workshop. Uh, for ext.js host by Stefan tomorrow afternoon.